and welcome to Opwell's Field Notes, a podcast created by Operation Wallacea to share stories and insights from our 25 years working in the field. My name is Sophia Wood, Opwell's Country Manager for Ecuador and Director of Friends of Wallacea, and I will be your host for this series. We launched this podcast to shine a light on the world of biodiversity field research and the work of those who dedicate their lives to understanding and protecting our planet. Each month, we have conversations with scientists, community conservationists, and experienced academics about new research, protecting biodiversity, and daily life out in the field. For our first episode, I have the honor of speaking with Dr. Tom Martin, Opwell's Terrestrial Research and Operations Manager. Tom is the senior scientist for one of Opwell's oldest and largest projects in Kasuko National Park, Honduras. He joined his first Opwal project in 2005 to complete an undergraduate dissertation in Indonesia, then went on to do his PhD in Kasuko as well. Tom is an extremely experienced field biologist, having participated in over 20 expeditions in nine countries and mentored dozens of budding scientists to go on to work in the field. In this episode, we discuss life in the field in the cloud forests of Honduras, how Tom became inspired to become a biologist, and the implications of climate change on biodiversity that the Honduras team have found in research over 15 years. Thank you, Tom, for joining us today, and welcome to Opal's Field Notes. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us today. No problem at all. Thank you for inviting me. Well, this is our first episode of uh, our new podcast, so we're very excited to get started and to have you as our first guest um, I guess since we're taping everything from home today, I was just going to start off with asking you where you're based right now. So I've been based, like a lot of people, in um, very unusual circumstances since March. Um, so I've been back down in the southwest of England since the end of March, um, which is a very sleepy place to pass the time. Um, where I actually work is quite unusual. Um, so where I live is, is quite noisy. So I tend to come into a model shop. Uh, to do a lot of my recordings and, and Zoom meetings. And it's, uh, again, a very surreal place to be working. I've got a, a six foot high Darth Vader cut out staring me down as I write this. So I guess it's, it's strange times for everybody. A lot of people have ended up working in places they had uh, not the faintest idea uh, back in February time that they'd be working in these sort of situations. Yep, that's true. I think that might be one of the weirdest I've heard, though. <laughs> and I was, I was lucky enough to see your Darth Vader right before we got on this uh, podcast. So I, I'm sure that keeps you working hard. It does. Okay. He's, he's quite a, <laughs> quite an intimidating presence. I can imagine. Well, to get started, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the work that you do at Opwall and really kind of what inspired you to become a scientist in the first place. Sure. So I've, I've been involved with Opwall on and off for a very long time. Um, I've been involved with conservation research even longer. So I haven't really, in my whole adult life, I've ever really done anything different. I've always been interested in wildlife and conservation issues. Um, I started working on applied field conservation when I was 18. Um, I worked for the National Park Authority in Zambia for an eight-month period. Um, And, um, yeah, I've I've pretty much stayed in applied conservation of field scientist ever since. So I I, um, was at university for six years in the course of my undergrad and my PhD. And that's when I started working with Opwal. So I first came out with Opwal in 2005 as a dissertation student at the Indonesia site. I then went on to do my PhD with Opwal as well in conjunction with Lancaster University. Um, so that was split between the Honduras site and the Indonesia site. Um, and so that's, that's 15 years of involvement with Opwal. In my current position, um, I did some work in Central Asia in 2016 and 17, and I've been back in the office full time um, since the beginning of 2018. So nearly three years now. Um, my current job is I'm, I'm a member of the terrestrial research team. So there's kind of two elements to that. Um, the general element is I'm, I'm generally involved with helping to coordinate education and research and conservation grant applications and so forth in, in about a third of the all terrestrial sites. Um, more specifically, right. I'm the head scientist for the Honduras site. So when summer comes around, I go to Honduras and I just stay in our site in Kasuku National Park there and, and coordinate the research program. The only other site um, I've physically been to, and um, I tend to go on the last few years, an average of once a year, is a Croatia site. Um, so okay. usually not during the season because the Honduras site is very demanding. So I, I tend to spend all my time there. But I usually go out for a kind of brief overview visit for a few 
in, in spring. Um, it's, it's very pleasant, actually, in spring. It's uh, good for wildlife, good temperature. It's a, it's a, it's a nice time to see Kirka. Um, so those, those are the three sites I've physically been to, but I'm also involved to a degree with Fiji, Dominica, Borneo, and that's it. Oh, well, I said Croatia, so that's, that's all of them, yeah. So you've got, you, you're working at quite a few of the sites, but obviously it sounds like Honduras really is your big passion and your biggest pr- program right now. So could you tell us a little bit more about the Honduras site? How long has it been around and kind of what are the main research questions that you're working on there right now? Sure. So Honduras is the second oldest Operation Wallacea site. So Indonesia came first okay. in, in the Wallacea region of Indonesia. And that's the whole reason why um, the company is called Operation Wallacea, which is a very obscure name, but people often wonder why on earth we're called that. <laughs> it's because for many years we only worked in the Wallacea region of Indonesia. And it was only when Honduras opened that it started to become very much a kind of big um, multinational um, expedition provider. So Honduras, yes. it, it's, I think it started with some reconnaissance expeditions um, and just kind of getting a feel for the site in 2004, I believe. And that kind of reconnaissance period extended into 2005. It started becoming a big systematic project in 2006. Um, and the project's pretty much running okay. exactly the same every single year, the same sites, the same surveys, with some extra special kind of one-off surveys as well. Um, since 2006. So that's getting on towards a 15 year wow. consistent data set we have there now. Um, in terms of its, its, its wow. research program and its goals, it's, it's, it's a big project. It's normally the second biggest in terms of volunteer numbers. It's always the biggest in terms of scientist numbers. So we have a science staff of about between 40 and 50 people. Um, and we're looking at all kinds of, of different surveys, the, the kind of standard ones we do at all our sites, like large mammal surveys, bird surveys, hepatofauna surveys, um, carbon stock surveys of bats. Um, Honduras has some rather special things as well, and, and we're quite lucky in Honduras in that we're able to take biological exports, which you can't do at a lot of the options. Oh, nice. Because yeah, exporting specimens can be very difficult. Um, in Indonesia, for example, it's impossible. So that lets us do work with mm. other taxa, um, that are not possible to survey in, in other opal sites. So we do work with, uh, we started working with fungi last year, which will continue into this coming summer. Um, we do work on dung beetles, moths, jewel scarabs, um, all kinds of other um, invertebrate groups. We've actually described quite a few new species to science from the Honduras site because we're able to do um, these kind of in-depth entomological and botanical studies, which are not really possible at most of the other sites. Wow, that sounds like a really big project to manage, but also very exciting. Uh, And I'm looking forward to seeing more of the species descriptions that have been coming out in the next few months. Absolutely. Um, So what, I know you've been working in the field for a long time. Um, What's your favorite part of working in the field? And then I guess on the flip side of that, what are the biggest challenges? Um, Favorite, but I guess there's two really nice parts of field work. The first one is is you get to go to very interesting places that not many other people go and see yeah. amazing things that you're in one of a handful of people who have ever actually seen that species or, or, or spend a lot of time in this particular ecosystem. So it's very exciting. Um, every single year you go to one of these sites, you see something you've never seen before. As, as I've never had a season where I haven't seen something new that's kind of taken my breath away a little bit. So it's very exciting from that perspective. It's also very exciting... Actually, there's three reasons. The second thing is you get to meet lots and lots and lots of interesting and like-minded people. Um, so, and again, Honduras is brilliant for that because you have scientists from all over the world, Honduran scientists, UK scientists, scientists from North America, all with their own taxonomic expertise. And they're all really, really, really interesting people. We meet loads of interesting volunteers as well. So you build up this massive, massive network of acquaintances and friends and colleagues and so forth from from working at these sites, which is always a great pleasure. And you meet new people every single year with a lot of shared interests. Third reason is the opportunity to do really interesting science work. So you're going out, to, I mean, Honduras is a, is a great example. These, these are ecosystems which are very, very threatened, um, but hardly anyone studying them, particularly Northern Central America, where the only long-term survey in Northern Central America and cloud forests. So there's an opportunity to oh, answer wow. all these really, really interesting questions and, and generate data to look at things that nobody's ever really looked at before. Um, so yeah, three reasons why it's, it's particularly interesting challenges. Hmm. So I went out to Honduras as a, as a, a scientist, a part of my PhD program. 
So these days I'm a bit more static. Uh, I do get out into the field a bit, but it's, it's more management. But I can say from my experience in 2006 and seven, like Honduras is, is very physically challenging. It's the most physically challenging op all site. I've walked every single transect multiple times in Kasuka and it kills you. <laughs> to any of the other sites, you the full transects will agree. It's, um, it's tough work. It's beautiful and you see amazing things. You get very, very fit doing it because you're always either hiking long distances uphill or downhill. And I used to lose about two stone in weight every year when I was um, doing full transects. <laughs> Good for me, actually. Um, the other challenge is, I guess, so that's it's, it's physically quite challenging in Honduras and different opal sites have different levels of physical stress. A lot of the, the forest sites in particular are quite physically demanding and demanding to live in, in yep. fairly basic conditions for very long periods of time. Um, I guess in terms of management and science, it's a big project and there's a lot to keep a handle on. You've got all these different surveys. Um, most of them are kind of pulling in the same direction, but some of them are quite specialist and a little bit out there and... Um, you've got lots of dissertation students doing lots of different things and it's, it's kind of keeping a lot of spate, plates spinning at the same time um, without anything falling behind. But I'm very lucky in that regard because the Honduras science team is extremely good. Um, we have excellent um, leaders for all of the survey teams that we run and that makes life much, much easier on that front. So without those guys, that would be, be a very, very challenging task. Um, but because we have excellent team leaders, it makes it a lot easier. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. And I really resonate with the beauty of, of meeting such amazing like-minded people and also with the opportunity to just kind of run into something that very few people have ever seen before is one of those big reasons that come up for why I keep going back to Ecuador every year and feel so lucky to work with Opwa. So I completely understand. So the cloud forest where you work in Honduras is obviously known for particularly high levels of endemism of, of species that kind of only live there and nowhere else. What's the craziest or coolest thing you've seen in Kasuko? So Kasuko, I guess you'd say that the um, the charms are quite subtle. Like it's not like going to South Africa where you see huge, huge herds of elephants walking sure. around and things like that. You, you see small things. Occasionally you see a large mammal, but they're smaller body things that are nonetheless still amazing and interesting and cool, despite the fact they're not elephants or lions or jaguars. <laughs> um so a really good example is, you know, you can you can see some just even around the clearing where base camp is, which is probably, I don't know, 50 meters across by 150 meters across or something. There's more reptile okay. species in that clearing than there is in the whole of the UK by about a margin of at least two to three times. Um, and wow. some of those species you cannot find anywhere else in the world. So we have these little anole lizards, um, which sit on just when you're typing up your work at the end of the day, they sit on the window pane outside, but they'll chew mm. that up, bob up and down. Um, that's Neurops Kasuko. You cannot find that species anywhere in the world except for the mountain range that Kasuko is in. I think it's found another location outside of the actual park boundaries, but it's okay. in that particular fairly small range of mountains. So you're seeing a lizard there that apart from people can't have well, almost nobody has seen ever. Um, there's some other really crazy things, like even rarer than that in Kasuko. I've never actually seen it. The one that jumps to mind is a frog. Um, I'll probably get the species okay. name wrong rather than the genus. It's Echnomio hyla salvage. I'm sure the hepatologist might catch me on pronouncing that slightly wrong, but that's <laughs> so rare. It's a frog, but it's, it's it's really bizarre. It's got like fringed limbs and kind of big toe flaps and things like that. Um, it lives oh, most wow. of its time in the canopy. It's probably been seen ever about eight times ever by anybody, um, of which probably six of those eight come from the Opal expeditions. Um, so you, you're talking about seriously, seriously rare things where either Opal discovered them and they've never been seen by anyone else because they've just been discovered or, or they're mega rare and they were discovered pre-Opal, but they've only been seen a handful of times ever. It's always you know amazing to see those micro endemics. Um, again, but there's all kinds of other things that blow your mind away that you didn't even know existed till you go to these places. Things like Dobson flies. I'd never seen a Dobson fly uh, before I went to Kasuka and they're these they're actually quite harmless, but they're really intimidating insects of huge great mandibles that, that I could chew oh, through wow. a metal door or something. Um, oh. you know, beautiful <laughs> moth that probably only a handful of people have seen. We've seen the, I think it's the biggest moth in the world we get there. It's not endemic to Central America, but the white witch kind of looks like a B2 stealth bomber or something. It's amazing. Um, the one that's about can, as long as your face. Yeah, you get them up as far as Texas, I think. So they're not strictly Mesoamerican, okay. but they're still amazing and cool things to see. So it's, yeah, the, the, the charms of Kasuka are the kind of subtle things rather than the megafauna. 
But I, I think they're equally or if not more interesting and cool because they're so rare and so weird and so many people, so few people have seen them. Yeah, that's very cool. I remember seeing the photo of that moth last year and it is absolutely humongous. I mm. think it's on the Opwalt Instagram somewhere. So if people are interested in looking what that looks like, you can find it. So obviously you mentioned that Opwalt has been in Honduras for an incredibly long time. It's our second longest project. And that means there have been major findings about how po- animal populations have changed over the last 10 or 15 years. Could you maybe summarize some of those findings and what they mean for protecting biodiversity in places like Kasuko? Yeah, absolutely. I guess there's two trends I would pull out. So we have long-term data on a lot of taxa, but two have been analyzed to, the, to date. Um, the third and fourth are in process, but the two that have been analyzed really carefully to date are the, and published as well are the birds and the mammals. Um, Mm -hmm. they both tell very concerning stories. So the mammal work, which is based on patch occupancy analysis of transects. So ever since 2006, walking in this huge network of transects that we have and looking for tracks and signs, occasionally direct observations as well. It's it's a relatively small forest, Kasuko. It's not like like Guyana or or Ecuador or Peru. We have these huge swathes of forest that go on as far as, you know, the distant horizon and beyond. It's probably only about 20 miles across of that east-west maybe more like 15 miles across east-west. It's little. I think it's even less than that, actually, including the buffer zone. Um, so, you, you know, it's, it's there's never been a vast populations of large mammals in there anyway. Um, and it's, it's isolated and it's, it's yeah, as I say, disconnected from other big patches of, of big forests. So it's, it's always been a little bit out there in terms of large mammals. But nevertheless, the findings are very concerning. So when we first started going there, things like tapir were rare, but we would encounter them regularly, Baird's tapir which is Honduras, oh, wow. is meant to be a Honduran stronghold for them. Um, other things okay. like deer, koati, all these things, would, you, you wouldn't see them very often, but you would find their tracks and signs relatively regularly. And there's a very, very, very clear work by the work that Hannah Hoskins and Neil Reed and Niall McCann have done um, from the mammal team that show a very progressive decline in medium and large mammal populations that just keeps getting lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. So most, unfortunately, it's very sad that we can see that in little fragmented populations like Kasuko, large mammal populations are becoming functionally extinct very, very, very quickly. And the, the core driver for that is almost certainly hunting. Um, habitat loss as well, but mostly direct poaching, which is completely illegal because it's a national park. Um, but, you know, we found things like tapir carcasses which have been butchered and all kinds of things like that. Oh, wow. So we have, we have evidence that you know, hunting and habitat loss is, is driving mammal declines. And you need to take very urgent conservation action to prevent that. We're, we're working on a huge biodiverse landscape fund application, which is funded by the UK government. It hasn't opened yet. It got delayed because of COVID, but we're hoping March is going to open to try and arrest those trends. The other Excellent. slightly different long-term data set we've analysed is the birds. And what birds show is very interesting. Um not completely unique in what it shows. Uh, there are other studies that show it, but we show it on a very fine resolution. So we've been doing, I say we, but it's, it's mostly led by Sam Jones, um, who's led the ornithology team in Kasuko for a very long time, and, and the guys working with Sam. Um, they, they've been doing these long-term point counts. We do misnetting as well, but this, this particular study is based on the point counts. We're doing the same point counts for birds going to the same place in the park every single year for 15 years. Actually, it was 10 years when it was published and seeing what bird communities are doing. And what they've noticed, and this is is published in Biotropica. One thing I just wanted to pause you for one second and see if you could just quickly explain what point counts are for our listeners who might not know. Yeah, so a point count is is a standardized way of censusing birds. So you go to a point um, on a transect, you usually have between five and seven points on a transect, they're separated by 200 meters. And you get to that point, this is all very, very early in the morning. So kind of sunset to two hours after sunset. And then you do a 10 minute count where you just record everything you see and everything you hear. Um, and then you apply a radius of that 50 meters. So it's kind of reducing bias. It's probably in a cloud for it. In, in South Africa, it would be probably 80% what you see, 20% what you hear. In Kasuko, it's, it's probably more like 90% what you hear. 10% what you see because right. detect, seeing birds in, in dense cloud forests and any rainforest really is um, very, very, very yes. difficult. So yeah, it's, it's an exercise. You've got to learn the bird calls um, by ear, which is really hard actually. Kasuka is probably like the, the cusp of complexity where you can still do it. Any more <laughs> complexity, like, Kasuka, I think it's got about 270 species. 
Okay. We have about 550 in Ecuador, yeah. so it's quite... And theoretically, in Guyana, I don't know if they're, they're not entirely all on the side, it goes up to a thousand. So, if, and the, the thing about Kasuka, they're also they're quite separated, and a lot of those 270 are very rare. Um, so most of them are common species. Sure. Um, but nevertheless, it's about the level of complexity that you can do a man point count. Um, anything beyond Kasuka, okay. like Ecuador, Peru, Guyana, we don't do them. We try to do them, but they're, they're going to be sure. a bit flawed. Um, and then you have to think about acoustic monitoring and things like that, which has its own drawbacks as well. Sorry to interrupt your discussion there. Just wanted to, take okay. a to make sure that was clear. So we've done these point counts for year, for year after year after year. And what we've noticed is that bird communities are moving up slope at a steady rate. Um, it varies a little bit between species and not all species are moving up slope. But there's a very marked provable trend that over that 10 year period when the data are analyzed every year, bird communities as a whole get a little bit higher and higher and higher up the mountainside, which is very concerning. Wow. Um, that's yeah. Two reasons why that might be, and it's it's very, very hard to disentangle them. So one thing about long-term data is it gives you loads and loads of information, but that doesn't necessarily mean that information is going to be crystal clear when you come to determining what it means. So the po one possible reason is it's, it's, it's deforestation. So you're getting trees cut down lower down at a, a unsustainable rate and species that formerly living in trees lower down are coming up the mountainside because they don't have any habitat lower down um which is concerning sure. what's potentially even more concerning and this is a very explicit threat to cloud forest generally is it could and we can't prove that it is but it's also implicit that it, it's it's almost likely to be a, a factor in some level is climate change and the reason climate change is there's lots of reasons why it poses a particular threat to cloud forest, but one particular reason is something called the escalator to extinction effect. And it kind of works a little like this, in that you have cloud forest a bit like a wedding cake, if you like. So okay. lower down, you've got you've got the biggest story at the bottom, which is the lowland forest, which has the most species, um, but it has the fewest endemics. Sure. So lots of species, but none of which are unique to cloud forest. And you go up in the middle, you've got another layer, fewer species, but more endemics. And then at the top, and the least species, but the most endemic. So endemism goes up as you go higher right. up a mountain and diversity gets lower. Um, but each, the point is each of those layers has its own distinct ecosystems, not just birds, plants, insects, everything. They're all like a wedding cake, different. And what global warming is, right. is implied to do is cause a shift in those wedding cake bands. So the, the big chunk at the bottom, gets bigger, it goes higher up the side of the mountain and that squeezes the next layer up. So what used to be low, low, medium level forest becomes lowland forest. What used to become medium level, high level forest becomes medium scale forest because the, the, the temperature is higher in medium altitude forest types right. and further up the mountain and so on and so on and so on. And the question is what happens to species at the very top? So if you're a species which is inhabiting the very specific, extremely high altitude habitat bands and that habitat completely mm -hmm. vanishes because it's been squeezed out of existence because medium level forest has grown up the mountain you could potentially lose every single species that's endemic to that section of the forest there that forest just won't exist wow. that high altitude forest becomes a completely collapsed ecosystem and everything in it becomes extinct so that might be what this is this this idea has been hypothesized and that could be what our data is showing us birds are a very good indicator they're very detectable. You get big samples. You can do all kinds of statistical magic with them. Um, sure. And what's happening with birds could be also indicative of what's happening in other taxa, which are harder to monitor. Sure. So it could be the case in Kasuka that all these cloud forest endemics are getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed into a smaller area higher up the mountain. And a couple of decades or so, they're going to get squashed out of existence. And, and again, that's something to be extremely concerned about, not just for Kasuka, but for cloud forests generally. Right. I mean, that's that's a terrifying prospect, obviously. And I was going to ask you if you think it's likely that these shifts are happening in other areas of the world and we just don't know about it and kind of what the implications are for protecting biodiversity. It's extremely difficult. Um, they are. I'm sure they're happening anywhere you get. I mean, the thing about climate change is it's by its nature global, right? So any ecosystem in the tropics, our forest is going to be inherently vulnerable to this process. And there's, there's ample evidence showing that it is true. Um, well, the theory, there's not that many studies actually showing it in terms of actual species shifts, which is why our study is quite novel, but there's plenty of data modelling 
how cloud forests are going to change given future climate change scenarios, if that makes sense. Ours right. isn't unique in showing it applied to biodiversity, but it's, it's still quite rare um, and quite scary nonetheless. I mean, I guess there's, there's multiple threats that Kasuko face and cloud forests generally face. Habitat loss is the most immediately concerning in the short term. It's also arguably the most easy to resolve. So you can sure. put into effect effective conservation management policies that can effectively arrest illegal hunting and can arrest illegal habitat loss. And that's what we're going for uh, mm -hmm. with this big biodiverse landscape fund. So providing alternative incomes for people who are reliant on clearance to make a living, more efficient agriculture in the buffer zone so there's less need to expand agricultural activities into the core zone, increased enforcement, expanding. We already have community patrols, which are run by Nile McCann's organization um, and, and, and Panthera, Frank and Castaneda. They're patrolling the, the park regularly and, you know, we get these the funds for this. We can massively upscale the, the extent of those um, community patrols. So hunting and deforestation is very acute. It's, the forest is vanishing very rapidly in Kasuku. It's, it's by far the most threatened operation while you see a terrestrial site. Wow. It comes down. It's very, very small. It's very, very important. And the relative forest loss is extremely high. But we have ways and means, of, as long as we get the funding to do so, we have ways and means of countering that. Um, climate change and the other big threat to Kasuko is, is chytrid fungus, which is the, the disease that's killing frogs. It's particularly bad. Well, again, there's a lot of ambiguity and argument about the, the virulence of chytrid in various ecosystems. And there's some evidence suggesting it's particularly bad in cloud forests and some evidence suggesting that it's not. But either way, cloud forests are full of endemic frogs that you don't find anywhere else in the world. And therefore, if they're dying from chytrid, they're going to have disproportionate extinctions. So you've got the problem of climate change and you've got the problem of chytrid. And neither of those things are very easy to resolve by applied conservation matters at a, at a local scale. Um, in the case of climate change, the only way you can possibly... So you can't just get a £2 million pound fund to arrest the effects of climate change in Kasuka National Park. It's, it's a, a global scale process that's out of control. So the only way you can do that is on a national scale by getting countries internationally to cut their emissions and nothing else is really going to work. And you can, you know, cloud forest is one example of one ecosystem that's massively threatened by that. But I, I could spend 10 minutes reeling off. I mean, the other, the other really obvious ones, coral reefs. You know, you can, you can of course. stop people illegal fishing and dynamiting coral reefs, but you can't locally stop the effects of climate change. Um, it needs to be a global scale initiative. And that's right. something we're failing on quite dramatically. Agreed. Well, to shift the topic slightly, obviously, almost every field researcher on Earth this year has seen international projects interrupted by COVID and, and associated shutdowns. What are the potential implications of this gap in data for biodiversity and protecting unique areas like Kasuko? It's significant. It's, it's significant for two reasons. Firstly, it's, it's a break in long-term monitoring and that's of course not going to be unique to Kasuka or to Opwell. I think decades to come biodiversity scientists are going to be looking back to 2020s the great blank in everyone's data set so it's, it's missing information um, in the grand scheme of things if you're missing one year from 20 30 years data it's, it's conspicuous but it's not necessarily critical but the issue is we might be missing important trends that are to do with COVID and which are alarming, and we aren't seeing them because we don't have the data to, to measure it. So COVID has had a, not just in Kasuko worldwide, but in Kasuko it's undoubtedly had a very severe socioeconomic effect. Honduras has had a very yes. severe lockdown. Um, park visitors have kind of dropped, Opal didn't go. There's been severe repercussions for exports of coffee. All these other things mean that conditions are not good economically in the communities that surround the park. And what that might mean is you then get a, a spike in deforestation and hunting as a, as a means of alternative income. And we don't know. So not going out this year. We, well, we can get a handle on deforestation to a degree by remote sensing, but it's not as good as actually being there and collecting that standardized long term data to really see the impacts of global pandemics on, on deforestation and hunting. Um, there was another point I was going to make as well. <laughs> uh, I guess Don't worry. it is the two things, I guess. I guess it's, it's, it's a generic gap and it's the COVID. Oh, it was the hurricanes I was going to talk about. We can talk about that later. Uh, right. Um, well, I was about to ask you about that. So you, you've, you've uh, read my mind. You can go straight to the hurricanes. Sure. I mean, it's kind of related to COVID in that 
I'm sure people have seen it on the news and elsewhere, maybe on our social media channels. Uh, Honduras has had one of the worst hurricane um, seasons in living memory. Yes. Um, there was a massive hurricane in 1998, Hurricane Mitch, which was very bad. I, I certainly the worst hurricane season since Hurricane Mitch. I think we haven't actually been there yet okay. to quantify, but it's probably worse. Um, so very bad damage to the park. What effect does that have on biodiversity? But more significantly, get massive damage to surrounding communities, massive loss of property, loss of income, everything else. And again, does that mean that people are therefore forced into hunting and deforestation because they've lost all their agricultural crops to the hurricanes and flooding and so with that and so forth? But at present, we don't know. The answer is probably yes, but we need to get on the ground to actually take some quantitative data to determine whether that's the case. And we won't be able to do that until eight months after the event. So we'll still get a handle on whether it's had an impact, but it won't be immediate. And so in answer to your question, right. yes, it has had a significant impact on our long term data. Of course. And obviously, luckily, Apple was able to react quickly and get some funding out to our partners in Honduras to help assuage some of that challenge but it's going to be a long and slow rebuild obviously coming as well out of the pandemic so to end on a slightly more positive note why do you keep fighting to protect biodiversity and prevent climate change you know seeing all of these problems seeing all the threats to Kasuko, fighting maybe in one of uh, probably Opal's most threatened site kind of what gets you out of bed in the morning to keep fighting for this cause Sure. Well, I guess what the bottom line is, okay, so the, the, the environmental situation in Kasuko isn't great, but it'd be an awful lot worse if we weren't there. Um, so our presence in Kasuko is very, very, very positive in terms of preventing as a deterrent to hunting and deforestation and as a means of providing alternative income, collecting loads and loads of data on cloud forests, why they're important and what threats they face. We have a huge review paper coming on that out on that very, very soon. So we, it is it is, a, it is a tricky, it is, you know, things like chytrid. You've got all these frogs that are just dying. You can't do anything about it. Climate change, you can't really do anything about it. But we do what we can. And I know that we are making a difference. Um, and it would undoubtedly, the situation would undoubtedly be worse if we were not doing everything that we do. So it's extremely worthwhile. I guess there's two, I mean, in terms of why do you conserve ecosystems and biodiversity generally, not just in Kasuka, there's kind of two reasons why it's worthwhile for myself and, and more generally too and the first is and this always comes up because people like to put a figure on why things are important <laughs> it's the nature of the world but of course you know, it's, it's it's all interrelated to not just biodiversity and and ecosystems but also the communities that um basically reliant on those ecosystems so again i'm sure the hurricanes in kasuko um were made much worse by the fact there's so much deforestation and it would have been even worse still if we hadn't you know, acted as a deterrent to to at least mitigate some deforestation. Sure. So, you know, by protecting these ecosystems, you're protecting people from floods, you're protecting people from disease, helping them with crop pollination, all these other things you could list off with a dollar value on it. I guess the more kind of fundamental reason why everyone I know gets into conservation research isn't because they want to get a, a cash figure on ecosystem services. It's because the world's a much more interesting place with Places like Kasuko with loads of weird endemics, you can't see anything else in the world. Um, it's The world's a very, very diverse, interesting place, and it's fundamentally important to keep it that way, regardless of whether there's a socioeconomic impact of that. And that's, that's more or less the reason why I'm interested in conservation and why I got into it in the first place. It's you know, protecting ecosystems, protecting wildlife, and keeping the world interesting. Well, I think that's a beautiful way to uh, sum things up and to understand a little bit more of what the fight looks like to keep protecting one of these incredibly special and unique places on Earth. As we finish up, I just wanted to ask you what you are most looking forward to for the next field season. Oh, um, collecting some very interesting data, seeing some more incredible wildlife and meeting some very interesting people. So I greatly look forward to it. Great. Well, Thank you so much for your time today, Tom. And uh, we look forward to seeing these research papers that you've been talking about and seeing what work we're able to continue doing in Kasuko National Park. Have a great rest of your day. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to Outwall's Field Notes. 
We hope you learned something new and were inspired by Tom's work to protect Kasuko National Park. Stay tuned for more episodes about conservation in Honduras and other biodiversity hotspots around the world coming soon on Upwell's Field Notes.